So as Tom has said, I've given my paper the title of Restrained, The Challenge of Restrained Lawmaking in Response to Unrestrained Terror. When the House of Representatives convened on the 17th of September 2001, six days after the terrorist attacks in New York and Washington, the then Prime Minister, John Howard, rose to give what has generally been described as one of his finest parliamentary performances. At the time of the attacks, he had been in Washington to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the ANZUS Treaty. And in his speech to Parliament, he poignantly reminisced. I had been for an early morning walk. It was a beautiful Washington morning. There was a touch of autumn. I had walked past the Lincoln Memorial and many of the other great memorials of that great nation which stood between us and tyranny on one critical occasion in our history. I, like millions of other Australians, was deeply moved and distressed. I felt an enormous sense of empathy towards the American people who had suffered this great deed. Now, I should say at this point that Tom has given me permission to go back to this beginning of the story, to not just simply start at the point of 2004, but rather to evaluate the years from 2001 until 2007 in terms of the national security anti-terrorism lawmaking during that period. Now, unfortunately, it is a matter of general consensus that the worst time to make laws is in the aftermath or during a crisis. The danger of lawmaking at such a time is, of course, that public hysteria will pressure governments to quickly develop proposals Without adequate, without adequate consideration of their consistency with liberal democratic values, or even whether they will be effective in combating the particular threat. However, the September 11 terrorist attacks brought home to law and policymakers a significant deficiency in Australia's counter-terrorism armory. With the exception of the Northern Territory, no other Australian jurisdiction had any specific anti-terrorism laws on its statute books. Now, this was a matter of considerable controversy at the time, but unlike Sean, I wasn't debating these issues at the time, and I'm able to come to them with a fresh set of eyes. My view, starting in this space, coincidentally in 2008, that was when my research on anti-terrorism laws began, my personal view has always been that anti-terrorism laws are required. We need them. Terrorism poses an extraordinary threat to both the lives of Australians and also to the life of the body politic. Contrary to some others, however, I don't believe that the exceptionalism of terrorism lies in the gravity of the harm that might be caused. Many studies have demonstrated that terrorism poses a statistically very small threat to individuals' lives and property, and also to the health and safety of the public. What I believe is the exceptionalism of terrorism is the deliberate refusal of terrorists to work within the existing decision-making framework of a democratic country, to use random acts of violence to terrorise the public, and through them to coerce governments to act or to refrain from acting. It's this that differentiates terrorists from ordinary criminals pursuing purely personal motives. Now, of course, regardless of one's position in relation to this controversy, and we can go back and see the heat and hyperbole with which this was debated at the time, compliance with international law was also a major imperative. It necessitated the enactment of new legislation after the September 11 terrorist attacks. United Nations Security Council Resolution 1373 which was adopt, un, adopted unanimously a couple of weeks after September 11, insisted on member states not only investigating and prosecuting terrorists, but also preventing and suppressing, through all lawful means, the financing and preparation of any acts of terrorism. Now, I think, with a couple of exceptions, Possibly um, one might be the need for measures specifically criminalising the overseas transfer of funds to terrorists or terrorist organisations. It is at least arguable that the ordinary criminal law would have been sufficient to achieve that former goal, prosecution and investigation. However, what Australia clearly lacked at the time was an adequate legislative framework for the prevention of terrorism. Amongst other things, it was necessary to ensure that Australia's law enforcement and intelligence agencies 
had the power to disrupt terrorist attacks before they occurred. It was simply not appropriate, desirable for us to simply wait until those attacks had occurred and to act afterwards. So in light of this, the primary challenge that the Howard government faced in the aftermath of the September 11 terrorist attacks was to develop a comprehensive legislative package to combat terrorism. On the 12th of March 2002, five bills of more than 100 pages in total were introduced into the parliament. Now, in my view, given Australia's inexperience in drafting anti-terrorism legislation, we had none at the federal level. The challenge of ensuring security without further inflaming community anxieties and fears, and the complexity and comprehensiveness of the draft legislation, the development of this package in the space of less than half a year was a remarkable feat. Lying at the heart of this legislative regime, and this involves one of the most difficult tasks, I believe, in formulating any counter-terrorism strategy, is to define the nature of the threat. What is terrorism? That definition, upon which all other aspects of the strategy hinges, must be sufficiently broad so as to capture the diverse motives, means and targets of terrorists, whilst not being so broad as to capture individuals whose conduct is not worthy of criminalisation. The legitimacy and effectiveness in practice of the legislative framework depends in large part upon that definition. Now, the size of this challenge, the enormity is demonstrated by the ongoing failure of the international community, despite decades of debate, despite the efforts of numerous working groups to reach consensus on a definition of terrorism. However, at the heart of Australia's legislative regime, a country which was inexperienced at the time, lies a definition which has been described by many as best practice, or at least one of the best in the Western world. As it was introduced, and again, I wasn't there at the time, but I would have been critical of the terms in which it was originally introduced. It was overly broad and vague. But through the parliamentary process, by the time of enactment, the definition had been significantly narrowed to require, in particular, proof of an intention on the part of a terrorist to coerce a government or intimidate the public. And also, an exception had been carved out for advocacy, dissent and protest, which is not intended to cause harm to the person. Whilst Australia drew heavily upon the United Kingdom model in developing its anti-terrorism laws, this last advocacy exception was a significant movement away from the United Kingdom model and a vast improvement upon the definition which exists in that country. The comprehensiveness of the legislative package that was introduced on the 12th of March 2002 is demonstrated by a simple list. These are some of the things, and this list isn't exhaustive, these are some of the things that that first batch of legislation did. It introduced offences of committing a terrorist act, a wide range of preparatory offences, offences of financing terrorism, and a regulatory regime placing obligations on businesses to report suspicious transactions bombing offences for targeting public places, terrorist organisation offences and an executive regime for the prescription of terrorist organisations, as well as improved border security measures, including expand power, expanded powers for customs officers and enhanced screening procedures at airports. This was just the first draft of legislation. Subsequent drafts of legislation were introduced in the aftermath of the Bali attacks, in 2002, the Madrid train bombings in 2004, and the coordinated suicide attacks on London's public transport system in 2005, as well as at various points in between and afterwards. To give an idea of what these laws did, and again, the breadth, these laws included surveillance powers to investigate terrorism offences, one of the most notorious are the special powers for ASIO, Australia's domestic intelligence agency, to detain non-suspects for up to a week for coercive questioning, special evidence procedures which allowed classified information 
to be admitted into the courtroom in a summary or redacted form. Increased police powers, including powers of arrest without a warrant and treat pre-trial pre detention. Control orders, which allow a range of restrictions to be imposed upon a person's liberty without a finding of criminal guilt. Preventative detention by police for up to 48 hours, supplemented by up to two weeks under state and territory legislation. And finally, the since repealed sedition offences. These are the types of laws that we saw enacted during that period from 2001 to 2007. As a legal academic, I could stand here now and run through what I see as being some of the problems with these laws that were enacted during that period. I come from a background of human rights law and therefore I could talk to you about the imposition, the burdens that these place on human rights. But what I want to do, rather than simply talking about the record of the Howard government in this space, is to do what Tom has encouraged us to do, to think about the legacy. What I want to do is I want to draw out four trends that I think emerged during these early years, from 2001 to 2007, which have unfortunately proven difficult for subsequent governments to move away from. And these have particularly become apparent in recent years in response to the declaration of a caliphate by Islamic State. Whilst early mistakes that I see as being made by the Howard government, mistakes of overreaction, for example, might be excused on the ground of inexperience, there is a significant problem associated with the continued repetition of these mistakes in atmospheres that are calmer. What these do is they raise significant questions about the capacity of the parliament to balance its role in safeguarding civil liberties with its responsibility to protect the physical safety of Australians. The first trend that I want to highlight that emerged during these early years is that what I see as being a failure to put terrorism into historical perspective as a permanent part of the threat landscape. The sheer scale of the September 11 terrorist attacks, combined with the impact of the 24-hour news cycle, meant that these attacks received unprecedented attention. Global headlines reflected a sense that not only the United States, but also the whole of the Western world had been attacked. And Australia's close relationship with the United States meant that it was particularly affected by this perception of direct threat. Along with graphic images of the destruction, Australian newspapers described the events as world terror or war on terrorism. And as John Howard noted in his powerful speech to the parliament, the perception all round was that the world has changed. We are all diminished. We are all struggling with the concept that it will never be quite the same again. In describing the level of threat John Howard and other ministers referred to the high probability of an attack occurring sooner rather than later, and indeed the certainty that one would occur. Now, my view is that whilst the Western world might have been experiencing a new level of threat in the aftermath of the September 11 terrorist attacks, the threat itself was nothing new. Terrorism has always existed and will always continue to exist. And the refusal to acknowledge this not only heightened the community's sense of insecurity, but it also gave the government the go-ahead to take whatever steps necessary to return the country to an imagined peaceful past. Now, some scholars have suggested that um, what the Howard government and its successors have done is to deliberately exploit public fear and anxiety in an opportunistic manner. Now, I, I'm not a supporter of those views, albeit that there can be no denying that there is a direct correlation between reminders of terrorism and support for conservative governments. But what I think the failure of the Howard government to rationally examine the nature of the threat demonstrates is that it's easy to lose perspective in these times. One consequence of the failure, I think, to place terrorism in its historical context as a permanent part of the threat landscape is that Australian governments have continually claimed that the ultimate goal is to defeat terrorism. Such language is certainly understandable from a rhetorical standpoint. It is a far more palatable political goal than to say we need to either mitigate or manage the threat of terrorism. That is, that it's acceptable to allow one terrorist attack to occur every year, but not to allow five. 
However, in practical terms, that's exactly what we are able to achieve, mitigation or management. The logical consequence of overclaiming, of claiming that we can defeat terrorism, is to perpetuate a search for a silver bullet. More and more measures are overlaid with the consequence that ever increasing inroads into civil liberties are made with diminishing returns in terms of security. And whilst this isn't an Australian example, if I can share an example I like to use in explaining this. In the aftermath of the London Bridge terrorist attacks in the United Kingdom, a proposal was put forward that was quickly rejected that one way of stopping such attacks in the future would be to require all car hire companies to either conduct or to commission security checks of every single person who wished to hire a car. Now, of course, that might assist in some circumstances, but more likely than not, it would create a multitude of information in which we'd essentially be left with a needle in the haystack scenario. So that's the first trend, the failure to put terrorism into its historical perspective. The second trend, and this has continued to the present day, is the, the role of legislation as one of, if not the, frontline response to terrorism. Legislation obviously plays a significant role in ensuring national security. However, it's important not to overstate its importance or to place too much emphasis on its ability to combat the threat of terrorism. The 9-11 Commission in the aftermath of the September 11 terrorist attacks commented of those attacks that it was not the absence of sufficient powers of the intelligence community, but rather failures of analysis and information sharing, which were largely to blame. Unfortunately, what I think was apparent during the years of the Howard government, albeit that it was understandable, and this has continued throughout successive governments as well, was what's been called a cycle of action and reaction of terrorist attack and legislative initiative. Terrorist attacks overseas were followed by the strengthening of existing laws or the enactment of entirely new legislative regimes. This statistic has been peddled out on numerous occasions, but as it's one developed by my colleague at the University of New South Wales, Professor George Williams, I'll cite it here again. Between 2001 and November 2007, one piece of anti-terrorism legislation was enacted by the Howard government every 6.7 weeks. More recently, in the aftermath, in response to the phenomenon of foreign terrorist fighters, we've similarly seen a flurry of legislation. There seems to be a new piece of legislation being put forward every week. In actual fact, I've calculated that there's a new piece of legislation being put forward about every 13 weeks. So half the speed that was occurring during the Howard years, to put it in perspective. The sense that not only could terrorism be defeated, but that legislation was the best means to achieve this was not limited to the Howard era. It was simply a trend that were commenced at that point in time. At latest count, 83 pieces of substantive anti-terrorism legislation have been enacted at the federal level in Australia. This does not include the countless laws which make minor or consequential amendments, nor the legislation enacted at the state and territory level. It's an extraordinary figure, and one that has led many commentators from both within Australia and overseas to describe the Australian response as hyper-legislation. The attraction of legislating against terrorism is obvious. It provides a quick, cheap, tangible, and relatively easy depending on the political atmosphere at the time, through which governments can respond and be seen to respond to international and domestic pressure. Another colleague at the University of New South Wales, Professor Andrew Lynch, has written that Australian governments have displayed a distinct reluctance to relinquish the political capital that comes with legislating on security. However, I don't believe that the enactment of anti-terrorism legislation is entirely self-serving. The threat is a real one, and furthermore, there is a need to reassure the community. Legislation not only is tangible from the perspective of achieving a political goal, but it's also tangible for the community to see it. It serves a very important purpose of reinstating a sense of security at the community level. The problem is that terrorism is a complex problem that transcends the disciplinary boundaries of law. 
just as it transcends the geographical boundaries of the nation state. What I think the aforementioned cycle of action and reaction did was it created a failure to draw together all the pieces of the counter-terrorism puzzle at a single point in time, leaving an overly complex and sometimes even inconsistent legislative framework. It also meant that non-legislative measures did at the time and continued to this day to play a backseat role. And by this I mean things like community integration measures, rehabilitation strategies, the kind of strategies that fall under the umbrella of preventing violent extremism. The third trend that I want to talk about, and I could talk about this in the fourth one for hours, so I'll be relatively brief. The third trend relates to the role of parliament as a deliberative body. Now, it's of fundamental importance, obviously, in our democratic system that draft legislation be given an appropriate level of attention in its passage through the parliament. Anti-terrorism legislation is particularly important in this regard, given its frequent deviation from traditional principles of criminal justice, rejection of democratic values and intrusions into fundamental human rights. Unfortunately, there are two things which I think impeded the ability of the parliament to perform its role during the Howard era. And there's a bit of blame both on the Howard government and also on the opposition in this regard, just to ensure that I'm balanced here. First of all, I think the repeated invocation of the language of urgency, genuine or otherwise, by the Howard government impeded the ability of the parliament to perform this role. And I'll return to this in a minute. The other factor, however, was the opposition's refusal, as it seems to me, although I'd welcome Michael Danby's comments on this as well, seem, seeming refusal to move away from this convention of providing bipartisan support on national security legislation. Now, there are numerous examples of this language of urgency, and I'll leave them for the longer paper in the volume. One that I do want to draw attention to and this is one of the most striking examples of a poor legislative or parliamentary process, is a response to the omnibus anti-terrorism bill number two, 2005. This is the legislation which introduced control orders. It introduced preventative detention orders. It introduced the sedition offences. It also introduced um, warrantless searches and seizures. This bill, whilst it was signalled in September, was introduced on the 3rd of November 2005. The comment was made upon introduction that the Howard government would like all elements to become law before Christmas. The government was successful in this goal, despite a Senate committee review finding that the completely new scheme was capable of depriving citizens and residents of their liberty and allowing far-reaching intrusions into other fundamental civil liberties. The committee, importantly, had been given an extremely short time frame in which to conduct its review. And this has been a common theme of the parliamentary process in the national security context. There were six days for submissions, three days of hearings, and 10 days to prepare the final report on one of the most significant pieces of national security legislation ever introduced. This breakneck pace is unfortunately a symptom of what I previously described as the back to front lawmaking of this period. Careful consideration of the terms and implications of legislation prior to enactment were replaced by promises of ongoing review and in some instances, the inclusion of formal sunset clauses. The problem, however, is that ex post facto review is never an adequate substitute for careful consideration prior to enactment. Whilst anti-terrorism laws were typically introduced using the language of temporary measures needed to respond to an extraordinary threat, experience over the last 18 years has shown that in practice, anti-terrorism legislation is virtually impossible to repeal. Sunset clauses are renewed as a matter of course, and unfortunately, the recommendations of parliamentary, parliamentary and independent reviews are ignored. To give the example of the ASIO special powers regime, these were enacted in 2003 with a sunset clause of three years. That sunset clause was renewed in, the legislation was renewed in 2006 with a further 10 year sunset clause. 
The foreign fighters legislation in 2014 preempted the expiry of that sunset clause and renewed the legislation until 2018. In 2018, that legislation was renewed until 2019, and in 2019, that legislation was renewed until 2020. This is despite a number of parliamentary and independent inquiries indicating fundamental problems with the legislation. The fourth trend that I just very briefly want to mention is the sidelining of human rights considerations. The Howard government was not unusual amongst Western democracies in the pressure that it imposed upon parliament to quickly enact legislation. The unfortunate reality is that the risks posed by such haste were far greater in the Australian context than in others. Rigorous scrutiny of legislation by the parliament was of particular importance given the limited avenues for judicial review of legislation after the fact. There are undoubtedly some instances in which the parliamentary process did play an important role. However, I think these are too far and few between. The problem in the Australian context, and this has remained to the present day, is that rather than placing the onus of justifying intrusions into fundamental human rights on those who seek to propose new legislation, there appears to have been a shift away from that, where, as scholars Gould and Lazarus suggest, claims to security now appear to receive less scrutiny than the assertion of rights that may restrict measures in its pursuit. Tom mentioned at the start of today that the purpose of this conference, amongst other things, was to identify new avenues of research in relation to the Howard era. My view is that in the terrorism context, at least in relation to legislative measures, that work's been done. There is numerous bodies of scholarship, as well as the reports of parliamentary and independent inquiries, highlighting problems, both in terms of the human rights implications and also the effectiveness and workability of Australia's national security laws. In my view, what is actually required here and where the work really lies is upon parliamentarians. <laughs> The work that remains to be done is for a higher level of political strength, restraint to be demonstrated in a field in which it is all too easy to be swayed by populist demands. Thank you. Except when it comes to make sedition an offence when it's about coaching foreign rugby union teams. But we'll put that to one side. <laughs> the Eddie Jones clause, we'll call it. Um, Nicola, can you tell us whether or not Commonwealth-state relations have helped, hindered or unexpectedly brought some good outcomes uh, from the proposals and the processes you've been describing this afternoon? Um, I, think, I think actually they've been, have had very little impact in my view. I mean, we saw very early on um, virtually a wholesale referral of powers from the states to legislate on national security to the Commonwealth. And since then, we've seen predominantly the states um, adopting legislation which mirrors the legislation which exists at the Commonwealth level. I think the difficulty, and this relates back to the comment I made before, um, which I sort of didn't get a chance to explore any further about the problems of bipartisan support of national security legislation, which is understandable given the high, given the high levels of pressure which is placed upon the opposition to comply. But I think that also relates to the role that the states are able to play. It's very difficult to play a role in this space in terms of tempering legislative proposals. It requires a, a high level of confidence to be willing to essentially sacrifice votes, which is the reality of the situation. As Senator Faulkner previously said, um, the wages of fear are votes. Um, so I think it's very difficult for there to be any political restraining factor in this space. There's been a lot of academic commentary upon the need, about the need to create a culture of restraint in this space, and I think that applies at both the federal and the state levels. However, how we do that, I don't know. So when was the need, though, for restraint? You said there was a bit of a catch-up in 2001, 2003. When was there, if you like, when was there overreach or where was there a lack of restraint? Is that in the, the fourth Howard government? I think it was demonstrated all the way through. I, and I think that's why um, I've sort of decided to paint this picture of the whole of the period as demonstrating the evolution of a number of trends which have continued to the present day. So I think very early on we saw, for example, um, particularly the first, of those, the first two of those trends. We saw a focus upon legislation at the cost of other measures and, and potentially even having counterproductive effects. 
um, in terms of senses of um, isolation and alienation at the community levels. Um, we also saw a failure to place the threat in, I think, a, its rational perspective. Over time, what we have seen more and more is those uh, types of features being played <coughs> out in response to subsequent terrorist attacks as well. The 2002 attacks, 2004 and 2005, all saw very significant changes being made to Australia's anti-terrorism laws. But rather than a sort of drawing together of all the legislation that we had on the books, a careful consideration of where the gaps were, we simply had more legislation overlaid on the top. So I really think that what's required at this point in time, and it's unfortunate that it hasn't occurred beforehand, is that wholesale consideration, a holistic look at anti the anti-terrorism laws, the 83 pieces of legislation that Australia has on the books. And would Labor have done it much different, do you think? No. I, I, I don't think that Labor would no. have done it. No. No. Uh, that's, uh, I, th I think that's the simple answer that I have. I, I don't think that any government would have done it differently. Um, I think that all of the errors that... It's, it's very easy to play political games in this space. It's very easy to use hyperbole and say that, you know, these are the failures of the Howard government, but these are the failures of government in times of emergency when they are not sufficiently prepared. So the Dems and the Greens did what in this period? The Democrats and the Greens displayed the only, I think, strong opposition but that's what they're always legislation. going to Absolutely. do. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's where we get our discussion of the human rights implications. I mean, one of my favourite quotes from this period, which really, I think, highlights why the opposition didn't want to engage in a lot of discussion about the core of some of the laws, we saw one um, government member standing up in Parliament and saying, only the Australian Greens and the tiresome civil libertarians would put their distorted view of human rights ahead of justice for the victims of terrorists. Only they would turn into victims, people who willingly and ably volunteered to maim and kill innocent civilians. How, how does one respond <laughs> to those kind of claims? Well, you asked Michael Dan exactly. to put his question, I think. Well, firstly, um, I, I don't think the um, opposition will um, in the past, uh, now or in the future, vote against um, uh, counter-terrorist legislation unless we want to be more unpopular in the primary vote than where we are exactly. now. Um, that, that's an option. The Greens have voted against every piece of counter-terrorist legislation, every, without qualification. No amendments offered. They voted against every. Yep. So that's the other extreme exactly. of what you're talking about. Exactly. Can you... Um, uh, Mr. Ruddock and I were um, both involved in this. Um, tell us the pieces of legislation that haven't been used and why they might be dropped, because um, it's a good point. If um, we've overcompensated to the other extent from the Greens, then it would be good to know. I, I think the answer to that is to be found in numerous reports by parliamentary and especially independent inquiries, especially those which have been um, made by the former independent national security legislation monitor, Brett Walker. I mean, amongst other things, Brett suggested that um, ASIO detention powers should be repealed um, on the basis that they'd never been used um, and went a step too far. Preventative detention orders were another that um, Brett suggested should be repealed on the basis that not only had they very rarely been used, I think only the state regimes have been used to this point, not the federal regime. Not only had they very rarely been used, but in actual fact, the evidence from law enforcement agencies was that they were actually counterproductive because they didn't permit questioning to occur during the period that a person was under preventative detention. So there are a number of pieces of legislation that I think have gone too far. Others, I think, require recalibration, which is a very difficult thing to do. Um, one of the key pieces of legislation that is consistently used but I think requires recalibration is the scope of the preparatory offences that attach to the definition of terrorism. Um, it's a longer project for my academic career to try and work out how you draft balanced preparatory offences and certainly there are scholars working in the space of criminology who've suggested problems without coming up with practical alternatives. I think in this space, one of the problems in terms of the interaction between academia and parliamentarians has been a desire on the part of academics to critique, 
to break down the structures of anti-terrorism laws without suggesting anything in its place. So hopefully in this presentation I've been able to prevent, present a more moderate view, which is that the vast array of our anti-terrorism laws are sensible. They are needed and they are sensible, but there are some problems. And one of those particular problems is the sense that we continually need to add to the legislative framework without undertaking a holistic appraisal of what we already have and where the gaps are. Well, Nicola, you've gone beyond being moderate to being eminently reasonable and indeed highly persuasive. So I'm grateful to you that, one, you're doing this work, that the Howard government is something that you're looking at, and uh, you're obviously well on top of your brief. Would you all join with me, please, in thanking Nicola? <laughs>